All right, take your Bibles, please. Turn to the book of Mark, Gospel of Mark, in chapter number 9. Gospel of Mark, chapter number 9. And when you find your place, would you mind please standing for the reading of God's Word. Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9. And we will begin in verse number 20, Mark chapter 9. And they brought him unto him, when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, how long? Is it long ago, ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Our Father, help us this morning to defeat doubt in our lives. Help us, Lord, to have the kind of faith that believes exactly what Jesus said. And may it always be according to our faith, as your word says. So please help us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for standing. We've been looking at the subject of how can you defeat doubt. And, oh, microphone on. I am so sorry. Mike, how can you defeat doubt? And, of course, the, uh, the father here is our example. Here's a man, has a son. He has been demon-possessed. He's been demon-possessed since he was a child. And he takes that child to Jesus because he has faith that believes that if she gets him to Jesus, that Jesus could do something to help him. But in the process of taking him, and of course Jesus said there, as we read just a moment ago, boy, if thou canst believe, all things are possible, he said, to him that believeth. And boy, when Jesus said that, I think there was a little bit of conviction in his heart, and so the father responds to that. And he says, Lord, he said, I believe. He said, boy, I do believe. And he showed that he believed by bringing him to Jesus. But then he confesses, help thou mine unbelief. Now, the good news is, is that he did not allow his unbelief, his doubt, if you would, to defeat him. And he still came to Jesus, even though he had some doubt. Now, the problem is, is that all of us struggle at times with doubt in our lives. And as a result of that, sometimes faith is defeated because of that doubt. And if your faith is defeated, then, my friend, you are going to get out of this thing of living for the Lord that like you need to live for the Lord and have the faith that you need to have to live for the Lord. Many people in the Bible had struggles with doubt, and we've talked about that. But first, before we look at the way we can defeat doubt, I just need to remind you of what causes doubt. Now, we've been through four things so far. Number one, we talked about the fact that because of critics all around us, critical people, scorners, mockers, Getting around those kind of people, hanging around those kind of people will cause you to doubt. They will influence you. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his what? His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, and his leaf shall not wither. Why? He's got, he's got the Word of God in his mind. He's meditating on the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the what? By the Word of God. So he's not, he's not getting around people that are going to bring doubt in his mind. He's careful about hanging around with them, spending time with them. And I'm not talking about being an isolationist. Man, we've got to get around sinners. We've got to influence people for the Lord. But you've got to be careful about making those kind of people your friends. Spending time with them. Evil communications corrupt good manners. So be careful of that, my friend. Be careful who you make your friends in your life. And that's what happens to those who do that. Number two, then we looked at Asaph over there in Psalm 73, and we find that he had some doubt 
in his life because of seeming contradictions around him. Now, we can't go to Psalm 73 and look at it, but if you were to go back there, you find that Asaph began looking around. He said, truly God is good to Israel. Started off just right. Anybody who read that would say, man, that's good. I agree with that. Amen. But then he immediately says, my foot is slipping. I'm struggling. And the reason why he confesses to us, he tells us that he's looking around, and he's seeing people who are ungodly, people who are wicked, and he sees them prospering. He sees, men good things happening. Like He sees them able to get anything they want to get and do anything they want to do, and yet they have no belief in God. They don't go to church. They have no desire to live for God. And as a result, as he looked at them, he began to doubt whether, man, living for God was worth it. And he began to doubt his own faith. Man, is it... Is it worth it, me, cleansing my heart every morning and getting up and seeking the Lord and praying and confessing sin? Man, it, does, it doesn't seem like it's worth it. And so he looked around, he saw these contradictions, and as a result of that, man, he began to doubt. He began to doubt his faith. And by the way, there are seemingly contradictions out there in this world. But we go to the third thing, and the third thing is, why do some people doubt? Because of a lack of church and Bible preaching in their life. Because in Psalm 73, after he goes through all that, about everything that he sees and how he's really struggling with his faith, he says this in Psalm 73, 16, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. In other words, he said, when I tried to understand this, it was just too painful. I just, I, I couldn't figure it out. This doesn't make sense to me. But then he says in verse 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God. Amen. Then understood I their end. He said, it wasn't until, man, I went to the sanctuary, the priest got up and read the word of God and taught us from the word of God. I, I, I got it back. I got my perspective back. Now I understand. Hey, that's all they have to enjoy. They can have it all now. But guess what? When they die, guess where they're going? They're going to hell. And that's all they have. So they might as well enjoy it while they can. And so his perspective was changed. And now he understands what's going to happen. And he actually apologized to God. God, he said, I'm so sorry. Man, I wasn't thinking right. My mind wasn't right. Why? Because he wasn't in church. And church is so important when it comes to keeping your perspective. Keeping your faith and focusing on the right thing. I tell you, if I didn't go to church for several weeks, I guarantee you my perspective about my faith would change. Because church is the place you come to to get preached and taught the Word of God. And what does the Bible say? The Word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of your heart. It divides a soul from your spirit, your emotions from that spiritual aspect of your life. And I think Asaph was getting a little bit emotional there. He began to see everything, and he's having a tough time. And so going to church is vital. Getting the Word of God into your life is absolutely needful in the Christian life. So that's where we ended. It's number uh, Next one, number, uh, where were we at? Number is very important. you, you got to think about this one. Because of our conscience. Turn over to the book of 1 Timothy in chapter number 1 and verse number 18. By the way, everybody doing okay? I had to rush through that because I want get, get to get, get to the new stuff here, but I think it's always good to kind of just kind of go back over it a little bit and get you caught up. Look what he says. Paul writing to young preacher boy Timothy. He writes... He writes, this charge I commit unto thee. By the way, the word charge there means an order from a commanding officer. Amen? And, of course, the commanding officer is who? Is the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, I commit, he said, this charge, commit unto thee. You say, well, why would, why would, why would they use a word like that? Because guess what? You're a soldier. Amen? And 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 says, God has made every single one of us a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now the question is, are you a good soldier? And then it says later on in that same chapter, it says that ye are supposed to please Him who hath chosen Him to be a good soldier. 
So that's where Paul is coming. He's saying, Timothy, you're a soldier. I've got orders from our commanding officer, Jesus Christ. I'm giving them to you. Then he says there, all right, he says, committed to these uh, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest, them mightest was a good warfare. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. So he says, I've given you this command so you can fight a good warfare. War, a good warfare. And then he tells them, and he gives them two weapons, two things that are vital if you're going to fight the good fight of faith. He says, holding faith and a good conscience. So if you're going to fight this fight, and if you're going to stay in this faith, as Paul said, I fought a good fight, I finished my course, I kept the what? Kept the faith. I've kept the faith to the very end. So every one of us are soldiers, and we need to keep the faith. And that's what he says. You need to hold your faith. And he points these two things that you have to have to fight the spiritual battle against your faith. All right? First of all, it's faith. We need to have a faith in God that knows God's in control and that God will help us. How many here believe God is in control and God will help you? Amen. Absolutely. That's what your faith should always be in. No matter what's happening in my life, God is in control and God is going to help me. But then he says about a good... So hold on to your faith, he says to him, but he also says hold on to a good conscience. You need both. We need a good conscience. Why? Because it enables us to be confident in our faith. They go together. You have to have a good conscience. Everybody has a conscience. We, we were born with a conscience. And the book of Romans chapter 2 tells us that, that the law... In Romans chapter 2, verse 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Everybody has a conscience. And that conscience, the word conscience means to know by. Your conscience what allows you to know between right and wrong. Everybody has that, and the law is written. That's why you go to other countries, and you go into areas where there has been no gospel, no word of God given them, but yet they, they, they have laws that are like the Ten Commandments. Laws against killing. Laws against stealing. And they have those laws. Why? Because those laws were written in all of our hearts. And so all of us, and, and a conscience really is almost like an amplifier. It amplifies. You know, back in the days uh, when I went in the military, guys would buy over in Japan, they would buy all the stereo equipment, and they'd buy the actual one where you put the record or you put the, or your, your radio goes on. I forgot, what is that called? The receiver. There you go, the receiver. Now, some guys would actually say, man, I want this thing to, I want to blow this thing up. And so they'd go and buy these big old Bose speakers, and they'd put in an amplifier in there. Now, if you just had the receiver, it could be pretty loud. But, man, when they plug in that amplifier, oh, man, they're going to blow you away. It's going to blow you away. I remember sitting in those dumb rooms, and we're just sitting there like a bunch of knuckleheads, and the music is just going bum, 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 like that. And the only reason why I was doing it is because of that amplifier. It amplified whatever came in to the receiver. And so that's what your conscience does. And, and the wonderful thing is, is that when you get saved, the Holy Spirit uses your conscience. And the Holy Spirit amplifies your conscience. That's why after you get saved, if you're, if you're doing what you ought to do, you're coming to church and you're reading your Bible and you're growing in the Lord, the Holy Spirit's going to amplify the things of God in your life and He's going to tell you what's right and He's going to tell you what's wrong. Does that make sense to everybody? So Paul's saying, listen, if you are going to keep your faith, if you're going to stay faithful, then you better hold on to your faith, but you better also hold on to a good conscience as well. You better make sure 
you better make sure you're listening to your conscience and you're doing what is right. Because listen to the rest of the verse. Which some having, what's those next two words? Put away. Concerning faith. And have made shipwreck. See, your conscience is an inner judge. And if you say no to your conscience and you disobey the Lord, you know what's going to happen? You're going to begin to see your faith weaken. Why? Because your, your, your faith only works as good as your conscience is. The enemy, the enemy of a good conscience is a guilty conscience. And when you sin, you disobey the Lord, you go against the teachings of the Word of God, it's going to affect your conscience, and you're going to get guilty in your conscience, and you are going to lose your confidence of your faith. Does that make sense to everybody? So your, your, your conscience is vital in the Christian life. And, and, and see what your conscience is going to do, it's either going to approve you or disapprove you. Now, when you do what's right, he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is what? It's sin. So if your conscience knows what is right, and you choose to disobey that, it becomes sin, and that affects your faith. And you begin to lose your confidence in the Lord. Your faith is not going to be strong. Our conscience by the way, it's connected to our conduct. Conscience is on the inside, but really when he says have a good conscience, he's actually talking about having a good life. Living right. Doing what is right. Uh, look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 5. Some of you don't look like you believe me. I'm going I'm to make you a believer. Amen? Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 5. By the way, 30, I'm sorry, 25 times Paul uses the word conscience. And quite frankly, I need to preach a message just on the conscience. It's amazing what he says about it. And look what he says here. He says, now the end of the commandment is charity. And charity is what class? It's love. Notice now where this love is going to have to come out of. Out of a what? Pure heart. And of a what? Good conscience. And of what? Faith unfeigned. Unfeigned means real faith. Proving faith. Powerful faith. And look what he says. From which some have swerved. That's kind of a neat word, isn't it? Swerved. You've swerved. Oh, no, pastor. I, I'm, not, I'm not living for... It's not that I'm, I don't want to go to church anymore. I'm just... He's just, I'm just swerving for a little bit. The word swerve means deviated from the mark. To be deviated from the mark. Have swerved, have returned aside into vain jangling. Vain jangling means talk or thoughts that makes no sense and are not grounded to the word of God. So Paul says, listen, if you are going to have love, if you're going to be the kind of Christian that loves people and loves God, well, you better make sure you have a pure heart and you better have a good conscience. Amen. By the way, if you have a pure heart and good conscience, guess what? You're, really, you're going to have faith unfeigned. Amen. You're going to have real faith. Amen. It's when you don't have a good conscience, you have a guilty conscience, an impure conscience, a disobedient conscience, then, my friend, that's when your faith is going to struggle. See, we're learning how to defeat doubt, but we have to understand what causes doubt. People who are disobeying God, people who are out of the will of God, people who are disregarding the word of God, I'm going to tell you, you, you don't have faith. Your faith is not very strong. Right. And you're going to struggle in your faith. And he said, and the problem is there are some that have disregarded their conscience so many times. The Bible says your conscience... Many others who have pastored... We would all attest to the fact we've seen lots of shipwrecks. 
I mean people who had faith, were in church, serving the Lord, uh, living for God, family living for God, marriage living for God, and then something happened somewhere along the way. They rejected their conscience. Their conscience said you need to do this. They rejected it. They disobeyed God. And by the way, once you head down the path of disobedience to God, there's no telling how far you go. Listen, a Christian can be a, a, Christian can be a, a, a terrible sinner just as much as he can be a wonderful Christian. When you start disregarding your conscience, and we all know what that means. When you do something wrong, it tells you you just, you just sinned. Now, the right way for a Christian to respond when that happens is, I'm sorry, Lord. Forgive me. Forgive me. And confess it to the Lord and ask him to and ask you to cleanse you from it and help me help me, Lord, to do what is right here. But if you don't if you don't, are not doing that, guess what, my friend, your conscience is going to begin to get defiled. And then it goes to the worst part. It gets seared. The word seared is the idea of cauterized. If a person gets a good enough burn and it burns their, their arm or wherever, it, it kills the nerves in it. And so you can touch it, but you can't feel it. Even a Christian can get a seared conscience. To where they, where they came to church and preaching would, they, the preacher would preach, and guess what? They used to get convicted. Man, they used to say, boy, I needed that. Preach on prayer. Said, man, I've been getting away from my prayer life. I need to get that altar cleaned off and get back to praying. Boy, I haven't been reading my Bible. I haven't been witnessing. I haven't been living godly like I should. But boy, after a while, if you come to church and you start disobeying and you start hearing that preaching, guess what? Doesn't know. It gets to the place where it doesn't even affect you anymore. You sit in church and you smile because you don't want anybody to know. You smile, but in your mind you're saying, I ain't doing that. I'm not going to do that no more. I'm done. And eventually what happens, you're a shipwreck. You ruin your life. You ruin your future as a child of God. There's so many things that will happen because you can't. So some people end up doubting because of their, of their conscience. Because of their conscience. They begin to listen to the wrong thing. And this is what happens when, we, when doubt defeats your faith. You turn from truth and truth turns to things that don't make sense. I've met people. I say, yeah, I'm Pastor Grandy from Faith Baptist Church. You say, what kind of Baptist church are you? I'm a... I'm not. A, I'm an independent Baptist, and uh, I'm not affiliated with any denomination. I'm a Baptist by conviction, and um, and sometimes they'll say, "Yeah," he said, "I used to believe that." I said, "Are you going to church anywhere?" Oh, I'm not going to church anymore. And I, yeah, I, I just, I, I don't, I don't live for the Lord anymore. And that's what happens. They get to the place where the things they used to believe, they don't believe them anymore. Why? Because they've, 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 they've defiled their conscience. They've disobeyed their conscience so much that it changed their thoughts. It changes their faith. And they begin to believe in vain janglings. They begin to believe in things that aren't even based on the word of God. Those are the people you meet and they want to argue with you about everything. I want to argue with you. And I said, but I'm sorry, but I don't see where you can look at that any other way. Well, but I believe, or I think, or I think this is what I think is right. And I always say there's a way that seemeth right unto a man. But the way we're in is a way unto death. Spiritual death. Conscience. A guilty conscience or an impure conscience is going to cause you to doubt God and doubt His Word. Paul writes again in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 9, holding the mystery of the faith. He's talking to a deacon now, talking about deacons here. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. See, you, you cannot hold on to your faith in God if you don't have a, a pure conscience. 
to where you're listening to your conscience, that the Holy Spirit's speaking to you through that amplifier of the conscience. And as you obey, your faith increases and your faith stays strong. That's why you will have someone again who believes something, but they don't believe it anymore. What happened? They got a guilty conscience. Or maybe they got around critics. Or maybe they began to look around and see contradictions all around them. Or maybe just they just stopped going to church and they stopped listening to preaching. They stopped reading their Bible and the whole perspective has changed. Does that make sense to everybody? And you begin to change. And let's face it, a Christian with a guilty conscience seeking God is like a thief seeking a policeman. He's not going to want to seek the policeman if he's a thief, if he's a robber. Why? Because he's guilty. He knows he's guilty. I, I, I'm trying to think. My dad, you know, we were, one time I did something I shouldn't have done. And please, no kid should do this. I got matches and I played with them in the bathroom. And I threw them in the toilet there and I was a pyro for a little while. I lit the whole woods on fire by my, my house. <laughs> Playing with matches. Big old woods. Lit it all on fire. I'll never forget, I was just a little kid. I came out with two sticks, fire, and the, police, and the firemen were out there. My mom and dad were standing right there. And I came out as happy as a lark. <laughs> fire, fire! Well, my dad saw the matches in there, and we all stood. My dad had all of us. My, 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 uh, me, my brother, uh, my two brothers and my two sisters, we stood at attention in the kitchen. And, and, and my dad said, all right, who did this? Who did this? Well, my brother, my brother Nicky got in trouble all the time. And so Nicky began to cry. Well, my dad immediately thought Nicky was the guilty party. And my dad thought, well, he must have a guilty conscience because he responded that way. Come to find out he did do something wrong, but it wasn't that. <laughs> and he thought he was going to get caught for something else. And, but you, you all see what I'm saying? When you have a guilty conscience, you're, you're not going to have a whole lot of faith in your God. And in his word. And then, and then quickly, n number, number five, I'm going to be done with this. And then next week, we're going to look at how you can defeat doubt number, because of our contradictions. I'm sorry, because of our circumstances. Turn over to Psalm 73, verse 13. Because of our circumstances. So, because of critics, because of contradictions, because of not going to church, because of our conscience but then also because of our circumstance. And I really believe this is the reason why Asaph struggled and started doing what he did. Look what it says here. It says, Verily I have cleansed my heart, 73, 13, Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain, and washed my hands in innocency, for all the day long have I been plagued. Notice now, for all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning, if I say, I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. Now, this, this to me is very telling. Look at verse, again, look at verse number 14. He said, all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. The word plagued there means smitten, afflicted, troubled. One commentator said it this way, my life has been a life of trial. I have not known prosperity. So he's having a tough time. He's, maybe he's struggling financially. Maybe he's struggling physically. Chasten. Sufferings means sufferings and trials. He was saying that he, he, every day I get up, it seems like it's a new problem. Has anybody ever felt like that? What is it now? Amen? What is it now? This is where Asa... I, believe, I do. I believe... This really is the foundation of why Psalm 73 was written. I believe Asaph is struggling. Just, things aren't going very good for him right now. It's a, he's, every, day, every day he gets up, he, he, he says, another problem, another problem, another problem, and this, and he begins to, to struggle, and, and, th and then he starts looking around, and he sees people who could care less about God, 
and yet look at them. Man, they got everything. It doesn't seem like they got a care in the world, which is not true. And we got to be careful what we think other people may or may not be going through. So keep your thoughts to yourself. Somebody say amen. amen. Quit judging somebody. Somebody say amen. amen. You have no idea what's going on in that person's life sometimes. You could see somebody with the biggest smile in the world. They could be having a terrible time. I said it to Miss Polly out there. Be kind to everybody because everybody's having a tough time. But listen to me. I think this is where it all started. And here's the other thing, Brother Kevin. This is a sold-out believer. This is the song leader for Israel. This is a full-time Christian servant of God. You say, well, so-and-so's, man, they're serving God. Listen, a lot of times these are the kind of things that happen to the most committed people. You know why? Do you want to know why? I could just quit right here. Because we have a tendency, I have a tendency, to believe if you're doing right and you're obeying God, that things, good things should be happening to you. Now, don't be a Pharisee right here. We do think like that sometimes. Man, I'm living for God. You may not say it to anybody. I know, in fact, I know somebody, tremendous Christian, a, a pastor, and he shared with me his thoughts. And he said, man, I've been serving God all these years. I've been doing this. I've been trying to be the best pastor, the best Christian I can be. And he said, and now look, look, look what's happened. See, he, he, he's forgotten. Just because you're obedient to the Lord and just because you're a good Christian... It doesn't mean you're not going to have tough times. Amen. It doesn't mean you're not going to have battles and struggles and trials and tribulations and, yea, even tragedies in your life. Some along the way, we got this idea that, you know, if I, if I live for the Lord, then things are going to be good. Look at Christians, most of the Christians all over the world right now that are living for God. Many of them being martyred, being persecuted, thrown in jail. And you know what? Many of them actually have a better attitude about trials than we do with our trials. Because they understand that in the Christian life, circumstances are going to come. But be careful, my brother or sister of Christ. Be careful that you don't allow your circumstances to get you to begin to doubt God. To doubt God's love. Satan said, hath God said? You know what he was trying to do? He was trying to say, you know what? God's holding back from you. God's not telling you the truth. He didn't tell you that that's a tree of knowledge of good and evil. He didn't tell you that. See, God doesn't love you as much as you think. You've got to be careful, especially those of us that, man, you're in this thing and you're serving faith. Don't, listen, if you're serving God right now and you're being faithful, you've got a target on your back right now. And in these days right now, the devil's out to get the committed. The devil's out to get the faithful. The devil's out to get the ones that are trying to live for God and serve God. Asaph was serving God, and yet he said, man, I'm struggling. Because my circumstance, and now he's looking around and all these contradictions. He's saying, man, is it really worth it? By the way, it is worth it. It sure is worth it. Sometimes we may think like the disciples when they entered the ship with Jesus in the Sea of Galilee. It says, and when he was entered into the ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, why are ye fearful? O ye of little what class? Faith. By the way, it goes back to the beginning of the message. Aren't you glad God understands that we struggle sometimes in our own faith? And that we, he, he, he remembers that we are but what? Flesh. Man, he's such a compassionate, loving. He puts up with so much of us, of our shortcomings in our Christian life. Thank God. Thank God. 
And then he arose and rebuked the winds of the sea, and there was a great calm. They were in trouble, but they weren't in trouble because of their disobedience. They were in trouble because of their obedience. They weren't in trouble because they weren't following Jesus. They were in trouble because they were following Jesus. And they followed him, and guess what they ended up with? A big, fat storm. And I'm just here to tell you, if you're going to live by faith and not walk by sight, you better understand that sometimes you're going to get into big, fat storms and big, fat trials and difficulties and tragedies in your life. But I'm just asking you this morning, do, and you may doubt God's love for you, but do not let it defeat your faith. Don't let that happen. Job, the Bible said of Job, said that he was a man who was perfect and upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. But he lost everything that was dear to him, other than his wife. He lost it all. But at the end, Job understood that God had a purpose in all that. And by the way, guess what happened after that? His faith increased. And he said in the very last chapter of the book of Job, verse number one, he said, now I believe that you can do everything. I think, I believe you can do everything now, Lord. If you're here this morning, you have circumstances that are testing your faith right now. And my friend, do not, do not allow yourselves to doubt, but if you do begin to doubt, don't let it defeat your faith. Don't let it stop you. And we'll learn about that. Jesus said in John 16, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I've overcome the world. When you have doubts, that does not mean you don't have faith. You have faith. Just don't let your doubt defeat your faith. Last verse. Peter's demonstrated faith by walking on the water. Matthew 14, 30. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Why'd you doubt me, Peter? And he did, because of the circumstances. He looked at the waves. He looked at the storm. And he began to sink. But as soon as he said, Lord, save me, Jesus stuck his hand out and brought him up. Amen. And he said, Peter, why would you doubt me? Hey, sometimes having a time of doubt isn't so bad because then you, you, you learn even more how great a God you have. How wonderful a God you have. He doesn't expect us to be perfect. He just expects us to use the faith that we have regardless of the doubt that may accompany it. I wonder if you're here this morning and you may be struggling with doubt right now because of your conscience. Because you know you're disobeying God. Because you know you're not living for God like you should. And if you're going to hold on to your faith, you have to have along with it a good conscience. You have to. You've got to obey that conscience. Holy Spirit speaking to you. And that may be your situation right now. You really don't have much of a desire to live for God. But it's probably because you're disobeying God. You know what you need to do today? Come down this altar and say, Lord, I am sorry for disobeying you in these areas of my life. Lord, forgive me and let me get up and start doing what is right. And then your faith will increase. Or maybe because of your circumstances. You're strong and you're living for the Lord. And you've got some circumstances that you're just really struggling with. Just don't let it defeat you. You got doubt? All right. But just keep going forward. Amen? Forward by faith. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for the faith that you give us. You've given to every one of us a measure of faith. And for the grace that allows us to use that faith. Now, Lord, I pray that you would help us as God's people. I'm sorry, but we, we have to confess, sometimes we doubt you. And sometimes our faith isn't as strong as it needs to be. Lord, help us with our doubt. 
Please help us with our doubt. And there are some here that may be in the situation. They're dealing with a bad conscience, a guilty conscience, a sinful conscience. Lord, help them because their faith is never going to be a confident faith, a courageous faith until, Lord, they begin to obey that conscience that the Holy Spirit has given them. And then there are some their circumstances. Lord, help them with their circumstances. I pray this message has encouraged them to not give up and to not let their doubt defeat their faith. Lord, we need you every day. We need you every moment. And thank you that you taught us how important our faith is. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for church. Thank you for people of faith that exhort us and encourage us. And you said, according to your faith, be it unto you. So help us. I pray. Our heads about our eyes are closed. I wonder if there's somebody here and say, Pastor, I'm struggling with a, with a conscience or with my circumstances. But boy, I needed that message this morning. I do not want to doubt God, and I certainly don't want it to defeat my faith. I want it to be faithful. And so, Pastor, would you please pray for me this morning? God spoke to me.